Hey, what's up guys, it's Matt with the Movement System. Over the past 10 years, coaching and rehabbing athletes, I've noticed something. Some athletes, despite having a lot of strength and power, just can't jump very high. There's a really interesting reason why, and not a lot of people know about it. So in this video, we're gonna break down why some athletes have a nervous system that hits the brakes when they try to jump. And more importantly, we'll cover exactly how to train the right way to change your nervous system so that way you can finally jump higher. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Let's start with the science. If you feel like you just don't have your legs under you to jump, it might not be a lack of power or force, but rather neuromuscular inhibition. Basically, your brain hitting the brakes and not letting you jump. Here's what I mean. An athlete with significant plyometric training experience will hit the ground during a drop jump and see increased force production as they utilize the stretch shortening cycle to absorb and create force quickly. Their brain is allowing them to create a lot of force and jump really high. However, as you can see by this top force trace, an untrained athlete will hit the ground and experience neuromuscular inhibition. Instead of firing explosively, their muscles seem to shut down briefly. This can be thought of as a protective mechanism where the nervous system is limiting force output. The athlete's brain is hitting the brakes and not letting them jump higher. Now, you might be wondering, do you have neuromuscular inhibition? Well, that's not really a yes or no question. Everyone has some degree of inhibition and it can change over time. Maybe you have a relatively little inhibition like we saw on the bottom force trace, or maybe you have a lot of inhibition like the top, or maybe you're somewhere in between. In any case, I think it will be helpful to learn first why you might have an ambition and second what you need to do to decrease it so that way you can jump higher. Okay, so first, what causes neuromuscular inhibition? There are a few different things. The most common reason though is previous injury. After an ACL surgery, for example, it's well known that the quadriceps muscle becomes significantly inhibited. This has been studied extensively and we know that it takes months of progressive quad activation training to get back to full quadriceps function. What often gets looked, however, is the muscle inhibition that occurs after smaller injuries like ankle sprains. The reality is though that an ACL tear is a torn ligament and an ankle sprain is a torn ligament. In both cases, neuromuscular inhibition can occur and the brain can be hitting the brakes. A lot of athletes are walking around with inhibition from previous ankle sprains, calf strains, or other injuries, and they don't even know it. We'll talk about how to train to address this in just a minute. Another reason for inhibition could be a lack of strength. A lot of youth athletes have inhibition because they just haven't trained long enough to build strength and break it down. Similarly, athletes with no plyometric training experience or inconsistent plyometric training can have inhibition as well. And then lastly, there is a genetic component to this. Some athletes just naturally have a lot more inhibition than others. Okay, now let's move on to the important part, how to train to reduce inhibition so that way you can jump higher. I categorize this into three different categories, yielding, intermuscular coordination, and max isometric strength. Let's go through each and cover the specific exercises that you can use, starting with yielding. Yielding is your ability to control your body moving quickly through full range of motion. I think the best example of this for athletes is at the knee. Athletes need to be able to control landing into relatively deep knee flexion at a fast rate. This is what happens when you cut and change direction as well as when you jump. So I like using deeper knee bending exercises like deep split squat jumps, oscillating or pulse squats or squat jumps or similar variations. I don't see a lot of athletes getting enough volume of movements like this, yielding and absorbing force to break down inhibition. This is particularly important in cases like late stage post-op ACL, for athletes with a history of ankle sprain, or for any beginner athlete. One of my favorite yielding exercises is working three to four sets of 10 to 20 reps of these split jumps, working on a bit of a narrower stance and really yielding and absorbing force through the quad. These don't need to be max effort. Instead, about 60 to 70% effort 
focusing on being smooth and rhythmic and absorbing and creating force will give you the best results. Work these into your regular leg training three times per week. Just like you work on squats two to three times per week to build strength, work on these fast yielding movements two to three times per week to extend your runway for force absorption and breakdown inhibition. It's also important to know that studies suggest that it may take four months or more of consistent plyometric training to break down neuromuscular inhibition in most cases. And that timeline can be even longer after injury. So plan on working this into your training consistently for several months before you'll fully see the results. You can rotate the individual exercise every few weeks between an oscillatory squat, split squat, or even doing these types of movements holding a med ball or an empty barbell. There are a lot of options for exercises that can work well here, but the important thing is to practice the movement and extending your runway over time. This is going to teach your body that it's safe to absorb force quickly through knee flexion. All right, that leads us into training method number two to break down neuromuscular inhibition, and that is intermuscular coordination. This is a fancy way of saying, get your muscles to work together better. When you jump, you might think that all of your muscles sort of activate at the same time and you jump, but there's actually a sequence where your muscles activate from proximal to distal. That means that your glutes activate first, then your quads, then your calves. Similarly, there's a specific muscle activation sequence that occurs when your foot is about to hit the ground during sprinting or jumping. You can develop and improve this coordination and muscle activation sequencing over time. If we think back to the graph that we showed earlier, one of the main reasons that the athlete on top hits the ground and experiences inhibition is that there was not enough anticipation of ground contact and pre-activation of the muscles. This leads to the athlete being able to produce less force and not jump as high. When your muscles aren't coordinated well together, you'll see compensation, such as the athlete's trunk falling forward, the arms getting tight, or the knees extending before the hips. So how do we train to improve muscular coordination to jump higher and sprint faster? I really like practicing repeated jumps and coordinating arm swing with ground contact. I like coaching a scooping motion of the arms that adds to the momentum and the upward phase of the jump. I mean, start by doing this with something simple like a pogo hop. This gives the athlete a lot of chances to practice and improve. And I have found the OVR jump device to be really helpful with this because it allows you to review your jumps, see which are your best reps, and break down the athlete's technique with them one-on-one -on -one and see timing of arm swing and coordination and coach and cue with that tool. I'll leave a link in the description below to get a special discount if you want to check it out yourself. Over time, you want to build up to more intense exercises like bounding while still getting that good coordination of arm swing with ground contact. Improving your ability to coordinate your arm swing with really forceful bounding motion at the legs is incredible for athleticism, and you see the best athletes in the world do this really well. Now, all that said, I also like training extensive plyometrics, which can sort of be thought of as low-intensity plyometrics. These can be lower-intensity skips and hops and bounds performed smooth and rhythmic. You have to practice these movements at lower intensity to build up to the maximal jumps. That's because whenever you're doing maximal jumps, like approach jumps or drop jumps, you're very stiff. And it's hard to practice and improve muscular coordination when you're stiff. So higher repetitions of extensive plyometrics can give you the opportunity to build that intermuscular coordination. You can think of it as an extended warmup that you do a few times a week. Pick four to eight different extensive plyometric movements like these and go down and back 10 to 15 yards, one to two times each. Then build up to a few high quality reps of maximal bounds or jumps. Over time with this strategy, you'll develop better coordination between your muscles and reduce inhibition. All right, finally, the third and final method for breaking down inhibition is improving max isometric strength. When you do a bicep curl or a calf raise, your muscle lengthens and it shortens. This makes sense. But something different happens during very fast movements like jumping. During a pogo hop, for example, the calf muscle doesn't have time to lengthen and shorten. Rather, it contracts nearly isometrically, allowing the tendon to quickly lengthen and shorten. The base for 
every plyometric movement, therefore, is a really strong isometric muscle contraction. And the faster that the movement is, the stronger the isometric contraction needs to be. To sprint really fast, for example, you need absurdly high isometric calf strength. Because if your calf isn't strong enough to maintain that strong isometric contraction and it starts to lengthen, then the nervous system will provide feedback and reduce force output. That's inhibition. So to reduce this inhibition, you need to improve your isometric strength. The calves are a particularly important muscle group to build isometric strength in. A body weight single leg calf raise or even a dumbbell single leg calf raise just isn't going to cut it here. Even if you pick as heavy of a dumbbell as you can do for a few reps, it's not nearly difficult enough to really push up your isometric calf strength. Here's what you can do instead. An overcoming isometric when you try to push an immovable bar will allow you to produce significantly higher force output. I like doing this either with a barbell fixed into the rack, under the spotter arms, or loaded so heavy that you can't move it. This position is also really great for teaching a tall posture and good system stiffness, which is essential for sprinting and jumping. A good protocol here involves alternating between four second maximal isometric contractions on each leg, perform three sets of three reps each side with one to two minutes of rest between sets. I've measured this on force plates and seen athletes build significant isometric strength within a few weeks after years of general calf training, not really moving the needle. There are more advanced variations of this as well that you can build up to over time, such as the ISO switch. That's done on a Smith machine and involves switching back and forth between a strong isometric contraction on one leg and a strong isometric contraction on the other leg. I actually have a full isometric training video that I'll link below if you want to learn more about isometric training itself. Overall, though, it's important to build isometric strength in the critical muscle groups for jumping, such as the calf slash Achilles, quads, and the hip extensors like the glutes. So to recap, there's a good chance that neuromuscular inhibition is limiting your vertical jump to some extent. Training consistently with yielding movements to extend your runway for force absorption and creation, extensive plyometrics to build coordination, and improving your max strength all work together to break down that inhibition and improve your vertical jump and athleticism. If you're a coach and you want to learn everything that I know about plyometric training, check out our full CEU approved course, Plyometrics 101. It's a great way to earn your continuing education units for maintaining your CSCS certification and learn a full system for programming and coaching plyometrics. You'll get full example programs, an exercise library, plyometric testing protocols, full plyometric programming system, great guest lectures, and a lot more. I'll leave a link in the description below so that way you can check it out at themovementsystem.com. All right, I hope you learned something today. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.